If you want to turn in your Bibles this morning, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew is, of course, one of four Gospels that start off the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each record the life of Jesus and his teachings And they're a great place to start if you're new to reading Scripture or you just want to jump in and start learning more about Scripture. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a great place to start as each gospel gives a slightly different angle and view and vantage point of the life of Jesus and the emphasis on his his teachings and understanding who he was. You see, Mark, the, book, the Gospel of Mark, focuses on the miracles and the ministry of Jesus as he walked the earth. While large portions of Luke, in fact, most of it, is a combination of Matthew and Mark, Luke is written in an effort to be a complete history uh, of the Son of God and who he was leading us to eternity. John is, in some ways, the most personal gospel, It shows Jesus as not just the Son of God, but also uh, the only way in which we can approach God through Jesus Christ. John is my favorite gospel. I love that gospel. It's it's a fun one to read. Matthew is in many ways focused on how Jesus fulfilled the prophecies, because we know that the Messiah was prophesied about, and, and Matthew's vantage point is to say, this is the Jesus, this is the Christ that was prophesied about. Let me show you how, let me show you how, let me show you how. And so, and so that is one of the things that he is most focused on in his writing about the sacrificial lamb who came to save us from our sins. Because of this, because of the reason for which Matthew is writing, he starts off his gospel with a section that is often a bit overlooked and mostly considered boring. Yes, and we are going to read it today. <laughs> because that's just fun. <clears throat> We're going to do it. And, and it'll surely be filled, as I read this genealogy, it'll surely be filled with my amazing ability to mispronounce names. So here we go. Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, which is a great name. (laughs) Somebody should really name their child Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amos, Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jechoniah and his brothers at the time of deportation to Babylon. Fourteen more generations to go. Are you with me? And after the deportation to Babylon, Jechoniah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abud, and Abud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Eliud, Eliud the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Mathan, Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation of Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Now there is purpose to the reason I did that. Why genealogy, right? Because if Jesus' heritage isn't traced back to David and Abraham for that matter, then God is a liar, 
then Jesus is not the Messiah. He had to be from those lines. So you have to trace it through the genealogy. It's actually very important why Matthew starts his gospel off with that. He wants us to know this is accurate. God said it would happen, and here's how it happened. The genealogy is filled with some very famous people in Scripture, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who we read about in Genesis, Judah, Boaz, David, Solomon, like I said, Jehoshaphat, Josiah, Joseph, the husband of Mary. But there's a name in this list that is unlike pretty much any other name. Verse 7, Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. Rahab, Bo- Boaz, the father of Obed, and by Ruth. Obed was the grandfather of King David, and Boaz was the great-grandfather of David. Boaz, of course, is spoken of in the book of Ruth. He takes the widow Ruth as his wife, redeeming her from the death of her first husband. And Boaz's mother is mentioned as well, Rahab. Who is Rahab? Why is this woman listed in the genealogy of the Christ Messiah? Only a few other women are mentioned in this genealogy as it's traced from the family line of the husband, the father. But Rahab is listed, along with Ruth, Tamar, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Those are the women that are, that are listed. Rahab's story is found in Joshua chapter 2. And that's where we're going to be today. And it's really important that you, that you grasp the fact that this woman is in the lineage of Christ. You see, God has prepared his people to go into the promised land. That's where we're at. He told them last week, you are going to need to be strong and courageous. I'm going to do amazing things. You just come along for the ride. Their purpose as the people of God was to live out faith in front of the other nations and show them that God is worthy of being praised. As God moves his people throughout the world, the other nations take notice and realize that God is all-powerful. Look at what he is doing. The other nations are starting to notice it. Now they're ready to take the promised land, and God has told them very specifically, be strong, be courageous, and live by my truth. Last week we discussed that a strong and courageous church submits to God. That's what we do as a strong and courageous church. We submit to God with the belt of truth holding everything together. We live by God's truth, not man's truth, God's truth. This week we're going to follow Israel as they start to enter into the promised land and we will see what a strong and courageous church learns this week. Joshua chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where they went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she also brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid out in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Joshua sent two spies into the promised land in an effort to kind of get a feel for what they were about to see, what they were about to do. And he he told them that Jericho was really important. Jericho was a stronghold that needed to be conquered, so they needed to check it out. And so the spies went, and they they looked around. And while in Jericho, they were discovered, and they needed a place to escape the city. And they went to the house of a prostitute named Rahab. And let's not gloss over this. 
they went to a prostitute's house. There's no indication in scripture that tells us the exact reason why they went to a prostitute's house. We just know they went there. As we read and understand the story, it's clear that God is moving to protect his people. And we'll see in just a minute here a little bit more about Rahab, which should help us to understand the story a little bit more clearly. But here's the deal. Rahab was a well-known prostitute. It was clear, even to the king of Jericho, that this was her position in life. What drove her to that lifestyle? I don't know. Maybe she was never married off by her family and was left with nothing. Uh, In that culture, in that day, a woman who had no husband had no right to land and was forced to do whatever she could to survive. Rahab chose prostitution and had a house situated within the wall of Jericho. And the men of Israel who were spying took lodging in her home. Likely, she offered them a room because she knew who they were. So she also lies pretty emphatically to the king of Jericho. And this brings up an interesting moral issue. Is it ever okay to lie? This is interesting. If Rahab tells the truth to the king of Jericho, the men of Israel are likely killed. And Hebrews and James will lead us to believe that Rahab was actually faithful in her lying, in her deception. That's weird. I would say this. Uh, Being people of our word is one of the most straightforward ways of living faithfully for God. But there seems to be a little bit of a moral gray area here. Now, the reason she lied was to save their lives. She wasn't lying to save herself. She was actually putting herself in danger by lying to these people because if she's found out to be protecting them, she's going down. And so she was putting herself in danger. And I would say that that is the, the real indication of where the heart was. She was lying to save people, putting herself in danger. She wasn't lying to protect herself, which most of us lie to conceal something that we don't want to be known or to protect ourselves. And I'm not saying that it's ever right to lie, but I think that there are situations where deception is the right tactic. Uh, Now, don't go home and say, the preacher just said lying and deception are all right, because you just missed the point. I just think there's there's something going on here that's a little bit bigger than just a lie. So at this stage, we're we're beginning to learn a little bit about this woman who is in the lineage of Christ. And what we've learned is that she was in so many ways not the type of person you would make a point of adding to the genealogy of the Messiah, right? Right? A a prostitute, someone whose greatest achievement so far has been that she's a good liar. That seems that seems weird. Let's move on. Joshua two, eight through fourteen. You're going to get to know a little bit more about her character. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and she and said to the men, "I know that the Lord has given you the land." And that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you went out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who was beyond the Jordan to Shihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heavens above and the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. This is where we start to see 
the reason for Rahab's placement in the lineage of Christ. Verse 9, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. She is acknowledging God as Lord. That's a big deal. She is an outsider. She is not part of Israel, the chosen people, yet she knows the Lord Almighty is on the move, and she recognizes it. Commentators have suggested that Rahab, by acknowledging God as the Lord, has begun a journey of serving the God of Israel, an outsider turning to God. Remember, Israel's purpose was to be the people of God and influence the cultures around them to worship God as well. It would seem Rahab was one of the first converts. She turned her back on Jericho and its king and served the Lord by protecting the spies. God was more important to her than following the nation's authority. I referenced it earlier, but, but Hebrews has something to say about Rahab's faith. Hebrews 11.31, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. This indicates to me that Rahab noticed the spies and probably invited them in so she could keep them safe not for anything impropriety or anything like that. She didn't perish, as we'll find out what happens to the rest of Jericho in a few weeks here. She didn't perish with those who were disobedient. We know that these people referenced as disobedient were the other people of Jericho, who even though they were scared of Israel and knew Israel served the right God, they would not submit to that God, but instead chose to fight against God. And Rahab turned to God, though. Where everybody else died because of their unwillingness to see God and acknowledge it and say, that's who I'm going to serve now, Rahab did. The rest of chapter 2 tells how the spies were lowered down out of the window of Rahab's house that was built into the wall. They gave her an instruction to mark her house with a scarlet cord and that would help identify where the family was gathered and that they would be spared when God gave them the land. And the spies leave and hide and are able to go back to Israel and share what they learned, that the people of Jericho are terrified because they had heard how God was on the move in his people. And at the center of this story, and it's not just a story, this is history. At the center of this is a woman who was a prostitute named Rahab. A woman who would have been looked down upon by nearly everyone. She was a harlot, as his other translations say. She was a nobody, a sinner of all sinner. Her job was sin. But she recognized the Lord. She made a decision to be strong and courageous. In the face of certain death, if found out, she chose to protect the outsider. Israel, because she knew that standing against God was futile. And her decision to be strong and courageous is referenced throughout history as an act of faith. We don't get a lot of information about the rest of Rahab's story. We know that she marries Salmon and has a son named Boaz. And we know that through reading the book of Ruth, that Boaz was a good man. So she raised a good son. And we also know this. She is listed in the lineage of Christ. A woman known for being a prostitute is listed among just a few women in the genealogy of Christ the Messiah. So what do we learn from all this? It's actually really interesting. You see, God has a plan for the redemption of the world. He sent Jesus to the world to be the atonement for our sinfulness, our iniquities, all the things that we do that are against him. He died for that. Our constant choice 
of sin makes us unable to be in the presence of God. His glory cannot be surrounded by our transgressions. And so Jesus made a way, the only way, to come to the Father. His blood poured out as a punishment for our sinfulness allows us to be forgiven. Jesus took the punishment we deserve. The gospel message that we are not to be ashamed of is that Jesus lived a perfect life, was killed for our sins, and rose again to call us to a transformed brand new life. No matter what you've done, you can be forgiven only through giving your life over to Jesus as servant of him. Rahab is the gospel message. A harlot, a prostitute, a woman so obviously sinful in the world, transformed by a God who makes a way for sinners to be set free. The people of God living their lives in front of the world and he is glorified when we just simply live faithfully. Notice that the people of Israel didn't have to do a lot in this situation. God had already done all that needed to be done. The people of Jericho were terrified, not because of the army of Israel, but because of the mighty God that they served, because the Lord of heaven was with them. They were terrified because God had parted the Red Sea and Israel walked through on dry ground. And Rahab saw the might and the power of his God, of this God, and chose him. Chose to be faithful to him when it could have costed her her life. She was strong and courageous. God took the life of this prostitute, transformed it, and she's talked about thousands of years later. She was grafted into the people of God through Salmon taking her as his wife. Her son Boaz was the great-grandfather of King David. The gospel message is that anyone, no matter what you've done or who you've been, can be saved from your sins and your life transformed because of Jesus. So, a strong and courageous church knows the gospel and lives by it and teaches it and shares it. This is the message we proclaim to the world that I was once blind and now I see that I was a sinner. I still am. Lost in my sins, chained by the decisions I've made in my ignorance, and now I'm set free because of Jesus no longer walking in darkness, but set free to serve the Lord God Almighty. And this is what we need to do. This is all we need to do is spread this message of hope to the world. We need to tell people of the God who can set them free. And here's the best part of it. Our life transformed will do most of the talking. If we live our life transformed like God calls us to, that will do most of the talking Evangelism isn't as hard as we think it is. We think we need to sit down and convince someone of all the reasons they need to follow God and know everything about the Bible so if they ask a question, we can answer it. Let me propose to you today that the greatest sermon you may ever preach is living your life transformed by Jesus and by the Holy Spirit in front of your family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors. Be transformed. Live out the gospel in front of everyone you meet. In every interaction with Jesus, people left changed. That's the thing. We talk a lot about Jesus' love. We love the Savior, like I said last week. But everybody who met Jesus changed. To the woman caught in adultery, who, <coughs> who they brought before him and said, the law says we can stone her. And so they, he said, yeah, if you haven't sinned, cast the first stone. And he turned to her and he said, where are your condemners? And she said, they have gone. And he said, I do not condemn you either. And we like to stop there. A lot of people like to stop there because Jesus was so loving and so kind to her. But what did he tell her? He said, go, sin no more. Get rid of that. Change. Everybody who interacted with Jesus changed. 
When you meet the real Jesus, you see his deep and caring love for you, but you also see something better for you, a life freed from the bondage of sin. And the gospel message is Jesus freeing you from your slavery to sin and transforming your life into something brand new, a life with hope. And if we get that right, we, if we get that right, we will see God move in our church because we will be strong and courageous. And let me tell you, it takes a strong and courageous person to start looking at life a little differently and saying, I don't need that anymore. I'm going to live transformed. I can say no to myself because God will give me the power to do that. I just have to choose to. I can live transformed in front of the world and me saying no actually helps my ministry to other people so that other people can know they can be saved too. A strong and courageous church knows the gospel and lives by it. I was thinking about it this week as I was reading through scripture. We overcomplicate things way too much. Throughout the story of scripture, God's people do amazing things, right? Eh, Not really. It's God who does the amazing things. His people are just along for the ride, living faithfully. And when they live faithfully, they get to see God do amazing things. And when they don't live so faithfully, they don't get to see the amazing things. When God's people are faithful, it brings about an awesome experience. So if we are a strong and courageous church who stands on truth and wears the belt of truth, we will also live by the gospel message that all can be saved from their sins and we will proclaim that to the world. So the question remains, will we be in our personal lives and in our corporate life resolved enough to be strong and courageous? Last week we started in Ephesians by putting on the belt of truth that holds everything together. And if we get that right, it's gonna be It's going to be a little easier if we get that wrong. If we don't live by the truth of God, it's going to be much harder to put on any other part of the armor of God. This week, I think it's pretty obvious which piece of the armor of God we're putting on. Ephesians 6, 15. And as for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. We're going to wear our shoes to go to the places we need to go. We wear shoes for all sorts of occasions, We wear shoes so that we're prepared to go. The wrong shoes in the wrong situation leads to disaster. I have yet to see somebody run a marathon with high heels on. I'd really like to see it, but I think that that person would have some serious leg and feet issues for the rest of their life. So I hope nobody does it. The readiness given by the gospel of peace. That's our shoes. Are you ready You should be. And no, I'm not talking about whether you're ready to have a theological debate with everybody that comes into the coffee shop. I mean, are you ready to live out the gospel message in front of the world that you were blind, but now you see that God transformed your life, showing the world that they too can be saved from their sins? Maybe sharing your story about how God transformed your life. A strong and courageous church knows the gospel and trusts it and lives by it and proclaims it. We live by it. It's all we have. Without the gospel, we're nothing. Without the gospel, we're just sinners trapped and chained by sins. But with the gospel, we're freed. We have hope. Jesus changed everything. God wants to forgive. That's the thing. He wants to forgive. He wants to transform No longer living by sin, but living for Jesus. And his church is his way of reaching people to tell them that. His church is his hands and his feet connecting lost souls to saving grace. So are we strong and courageous with the belt of truth? Submitted to God's way. Are we strong and courageous church that knows the gospel and is ready to share it? I hope we are. Let's go live it.